All right, we're gonna go ahead and start our panel discussion where you guys can ask questions to our keynotes and our keynotes can um, answer and interact and engage with one another. And um, I'm gonna be here to kind of just make sure that everything goes according to the, the plan, okay? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, anybody who wants to come up and ask a question, go ahead and make sure that we uh, talk into the mic for our audio back there. Sam, all right. So, so it seems like that you guys are like on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of the the innovation, the you know the the emergent behavior, and the you know it's just a virtual machine copying everything that it does. How, how do you resolve that? Because it seems like the biological you know forces of nature that are embodied in humanity are going to find expression, even if we can do emulations that might you know change that. You know, either, either of your thoughts on that? You know. The word biological carries some baggage here. <laughs> um, if we think in terms of, you know, entities that uh, reproduce and have differential variation and selection, that continues on in the scenario I'm talking about. It has a different hardware embodiment, but a lot of the insights of biology would continue to be relevant in a world like that, including emergent levels and things like that. That's, that's what I was thinking when you were talking, actually, because, um, what I do in my modeling is I do a lot of agent-based modeling. And, and so presumably these M emulations are embodied in a sense of code that you, you could, you know, there's the structural code provided by the, the brain scan, and then there's the software that, that looks at that and, and, and uh, does the work, makes it look like a brain, does, does the process part of that. And it, it, it's interesting to me that this would be a scenario that you could really set evolution to work here to the point where they might evolve into something really wild and different that, you know, these, these fast ones, you, you put a bunch of uh, physics brains to work in, in say, um, solving some particular problem and they might say, oh, this is very inefficient. We can, we can you know, tell the factories to do this and and suddenly this thing evolves that's very different than, than it started out. If, if, if you have mechanisms to, to have variation and selection on, these are really good M's, they're, they're um, solving physics problems a little bit better, so we'll, we'll use those to, to create a, the next generation. We'll modify it, we'll, we'll, we'll look down and modify it. So, yeah, I don't think they're, they're separate. I mean, I think that the, the basic ideas of, of novelty would occur in M world, and maybe to the point where they'd survive even longer. They 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 evolve to some new um, thing. I, I actually have a uh, science fiction story that was published in Nature Futures about AIs that physicists start using to do astrophysics, and all of a sudden they're asking for more data. That their unit of conversation is the scientific paper, and they begin to write scientific papers on astrophysics problems and pretty soon the physicists can't understand the language that they've evolved into and, and, and the files get bigger and they have no idea what these agents are doing. They, 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 they've even quit, they can't read the papers, they, they go beyond. And I could see that happening. I mean, this, this actually makes some sense to me. This would be a way of simulating intelligence that makes sense. Biology is one of those squares that wasn't filled in on my graph. Yeah, so, <laughs> I, I actually know. noticed that. So. <laughs> so I've used a lot of economics comment, but I would love for a good biologist to try to apply biological concepts to the scenario I work on. I'm sure they would come up with some insights that I Yeah, yeah I, I think, because um, I think the potential is there to turn this into an evolutionarily expanding system. I mean, why not? <laughs> Along those lines, when I hear that there is likely to be 500 types of M's, you know, give or take. Um, in the first two years. In the first two years, because who knows what's coming after that. I sense some tension with what I have been educated in in regards to the value of biodiversity. So I'm interested in both of you commenting on that tension that I sense in that. Um, expand a little bit. The biodiversity on Earth or within the M 
the, the, the diversity in the M within or? within the M environment now I don't think there's such a thing as a perfectly oh, okay. closed system okay, yeah so the latter becomes relevant right, right. but um, I'd be happy hearing your perspective on the M environment itself and then even beyond that and yeah. how they would interact I, if you ask in biology what's the optimal variety within a species most species don't actually embody that much variety. They, they embody a variety in their DNA as, as resources mm -hmm. that they can pull in, but the actual variety in the population distribution is actually relatively small. You might say that an ecology is better when that has a lot of variety, and I will defer to you about what the evidence yeah. actually is on that, but, yeah. but that's not something anyone local is in, in control of. I mean, you, know, you could say the same thing about our, our industry world today. I mean, if we have a few dozen suppliers for each industry, then you might think that's, lower in, that's too low a diversity, but again, from each customer's point of view, they're getting what they want, so it's kind of hard. Just like the species, you might think the, the world would be better if the species had more variety in them, but the species are competing and they choose the variety that they... Yeah, use. and, and the, the way the variety plays out is just in selection. Those, if you're just slightly better than your neighbor, because of the variation, that whatever variation's there, that's what gets selected, and that's that's they become sort of the evolutionary basis and, and trajectory for with, that. With rapidly changing environments, you can select for more variety, and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that human that helps select for human generality because you know human generality is a is a way to generate variety. Uh, so, but the M world doesn't necessarily have enormous rates of change. It just you know, it's not a it's not a rapidly changing environment. The weather matters less for them. Would external weather increase the odds of us choosing to introduce more M's? Well, I'd be really tempted in M world if I if I were setting it up originally to really add a source of variation so that I could could put a, a, a selective component in those that behave the most efficiently or do their jobs better or or um, accomplish what they're they're supposed to do and. Um, that, that would actually let this kind of evolutionary scenario flower. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know without really understanding the, the, what kind of software we'll be using and things, but um, one of the things that I, I've used to try to capture that in, in my agent-based model, so my, my agents are, are, are tetsy flies flying around tetsy world, and they're, they're not M's, but they have, they have, um, they don't have a neurology, but they sense their world. They can see where there's a prey uh, zebra to go over to it. There may be a mate there that they can mate with. And um, one, of the, one of the things I can do is impose uh, variation enough that I can get a selective regime. So my, my tetsy flies actually have a, a genetics uh, that, that has random mutations in it. And so, they can get better at better at, at re using the resources of their world. They can find the prey more efficiently. They can um, uh, be more successful in, in finding mates or, or breeding or harboring disease or whatever, or not harboring disease, all those kinds of things. And so um, in, in it's, 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 it's not quite M world, but it, it has some of the same components. So I'm, I'm, I'm using, I'm creating a virtual world with flies that have some basic senses that that uh, view their world, and evolutionary algorithms are what I use to try to enhance the information that I'm being provided with about that 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 virtual world. So um, I could see that being a part of them that would be really interesting, actually. Just, just to be clear, we're in a world today where we know there's a bunch of parameters of our world that are just wrong. But we, nobody runs the world, so nobody does <laughs> yeah, So right. in a future world that nobody runs, that can also continue to be true. There could be too much or too little variety. There's just mm -hmm. lots of ways the world could have parameters that are wrong, but if nobody runs the world, that's right. the way it happens. Just like today. Yeah. <laughs> My so we're in a lousy simulation here in this. <laughs> Nobody's managing the garden. Yeah. I'm working on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Might not be the right question for this panel set here in the subject matter, but I'll ask it anyhow. I'm not sure if I have uh, another time to ask it. And I'm wondering about the role that religion plays in modifying uh, transhumanist approach. So I'm wondering if there are uh, Jewish, Islam, Hindu, Buddhist transhumanist associations, and if not, what, how might they modify this sort of consideration? That's an interesting question. I'll, I'll defer to you, but 
could, could Islam appear in the M if, 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 if many of the, the, the M's were scanned from Muslim brains? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't mean to be asking about M's. We'll answer it anyway. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, so, so actually I think most, like the guy who talked about religion said, most of our religions started in the actual age. They survived the Industrial Revolution just fine. I got to figure they've survived this transition just fine. So I got to predict all the same religions are, are the religions for the M's. So there'll be Mormon M's yeah, in yeah, there yeah, having yeah. their Mormon transhumanist uh, meetings but, and yeah, I like if it. There, if there are only a few hundred, it's highly unlikely any of us are among them. <laughs> no, not, not like he is. Well, I think he was asking about transhumanists today. And oh. It's toward transhumanists. How does our various religious backgrounds affect that? And uh, that I will defer to people who spend a lot more time. In the yeah, I'm, I'm new to it too, so. <laughs> I think as you're seeing uh, the evolution of religion happening, that you're gonna see this happening across the board with a lot of uh, religions. It's, this isn't something that's just specific that's happening to just Mormonism or just Christianity. As technology rapidly increases, you're going to see this trend happening across the board to various religions. And if there's anything that religions are really capable of, it's adapting to survive because we do this as societies together. So I see that definitely happening. Quick comment to answer the question explicitly. There is a Christian transhumanist association that has 250 members about. Um, Micah, where's Micah? Micah would be happy to talk with you about that. Um, and there are smaller religious transhumanist associations that have been around. Some have died, some have um, survived, but the two biggest right now are the Mormon Transhumanist Association and the Christian Transhumanist Association. So the, the question that interests me is we, would we send missionaries into the M to try to spread the influence of Mormon M? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah that's right. <laughs> So you mentioned the, the three critical technologies, uh, computers, the ability to, to scan the brain at a very small level, and then the kind of the, the emulation of actually knowing how it works. Now, I'm obviously not an expert, but you know, you hear things, and what, the one thing I keep hearing about, or the thing that kept coming up on the subject was that they were trying to emulate a roundworm, and it had 302 neurons, and they're having a very difficult time doing that. So I guess I'd like you to speak to reasons to be optimistic about brain emulation, and, and why, why it's proceeding faster than artificial intelligence, true artificial intelligence, and maybe you could speak for, to reasons to be pessimistic about this sort of biological emulation. Uh, sure, so um, we actually have decent emulations of the first few layers of visual and auditory input in the brain. That is, people have made prosthetics for that. So uh, whatever those cells are doing, we've had successful emulations of. Of course, brain cells well, elsewhere do other things. Uh, but it, it's what, notice that in almost all organs in the body, the thing that each organ does for the body is usually pretty simple compared to the complexity of the cell itself. So a bone cell or a blood cell or, or a muscle cell, each cell is enormously complicated because all cells are, have to be complicated in order to reproduce. But the thing they're doing is really pretty simple for the rest of the body. So the, the key question about the brain cell is, how much is each cell doing for the computation of the brain as opposed to all the other things cells have to do. So, you know, basically, the more comp complex it is, the longer it'll take. But my story doesn't depend much on when it starts, you see. If you say it, it takes longer, it takes another century, I go, okay, it happens a century later. But still, it plays out the same way. So, so it's more about, is it even possible at all? So then you have to tell me, you know, you know that somehow what these brain cells are doing are so complicated and so intricate that, you know, we just never figure out a way to model yeah, um, so uh, simulation is always going to be, um, typically simulations are, 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 are used to, to answer specific questions. Simulating the brain is going to be really hard. And the reason is, is it's a very, very large number of system. I mean, I, I, I heard, but I can't remember, but the number of connections uh, between the the brain is some really astronomical number. I mean, you, you think about each brain cell having, um, you know, 10, 20 tendrils connecting with 10, 20, the, the numbers get astronomical. 10 to the 14th. 10 to the 14th, and that's that's a lot. That's That's a huge number. And so not only do we have to encode that information and those con connections, we have to, we have to process things that are, that are moving with those connections, forming new connections, brains make new connections, they do all kinds of things. So it's gonna be really 
hard. The only way I think that computationally in the near future it could happen is with quantum computing. Quantum computing adds a, a level where that kind of um, number isn't, in, uh, isn't intimidating. Uh, that kind of numbers in, in, in the current computational environment, even if you add Moore's law, is, is not going to capture that kind of complexity. Because it, it's, com it's complex just in terms of the number of connections and things that are going on, but managing those connections is going to take a lot of computational overhead. It's, it's, it's an incredibly con uh, computationally hard problem, but I don't, I don't really see it as anything but a technological problem. I think, I think, I think, um, I mean, I, the one, the one place where I might be more optimistic is in the ability to, by that time, have non-destructive brain scans um, that would, uh, would allow you to uh, scan a brain, create an emulation of it, um, may, you know, and, and all this is hypothetical. I mean, we don't have that technology, and we actually don't have the computational ability right now. But these are these are technological problems that we see progress. I mean, there's there's comp the, the 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 first um, we suspect <laughs> there's there's some question, but it looks like uh, quantum computers are going to be a thing uh, soon. These problems are being solved, and if we get that, then then we have the the computational ability to handle those kinds of large number systems and there's only a few systems that quantum systems have a speed up on so there are a few particular systems including search and uh, factoring right they, but most most random computation actually doesn't get sped up much by quantum computing. is that right is that right yeah, yeah. so th then it's a real problem um, I, I'm thinking about things and, and those might be the big problems though it might be kind of quantum co computational parsing these large number systems into to simulate, simulable, is that a word? Um, <laughs> sure, we're trying to do this. Okay, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, um, but it is, it is a massive computational problem, and it's gonna take uh, some technology to, to get us through there. I, I'm, I'm optimistic that it'll be there, that'll happen, you know, if not this century, you know, as you, as you said. A it'll, century or two. A century or two, yeah. Um, but I, but I, but I, I don't think there's any conceptual problem with a brain scan, and and if we can do that, that's going to be amazing. So I have a question for both of you. Um, one of the critiques we get as transhumanists sometimes, at least I get this critique, is this idea of we're taking evolution into our own hands, and what makes us think we can do a better do job than what evolution is doing. And so in many ways, I've thought of technology as just the extension of evolution, just evolution doing its job and doing its thing. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, what would you say to that critique to try and explain to someone um, how, ev how technology is just a natural part of the evolutionary process? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, first you introduce the idea of cultural evolution. <laughs> You say that humans introduced cultural evolution, which allowed a much more rapid evolution than a genetic evolution could embody, and that's been going on for several million years. So it's not a new hypothetical. So we, we understand, and that's a decentralized process. That's not us taking control of evolution. That's just us being the embodied elements of the evolution process. That is, we embody culture in our heads, and we share it with each other, and we don't, you know, we are evolving culturally. This, this is just another continuation of, of that sort of cultural evolution, basically. So to you, the evolution of the end would be just as much as natural as... The human know. cultural evolution has been for two million yeah. years. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, this, this, this will sound weird, but I think everything that humans do is natural in a sense. I mean, the idea that, that humans have escaped nature, I think, no. I think is wrong. And so... Um, I, I think that's right. I think cultural evolution, I think the evolution that we see, the, the fact the, that it's been an evolutionary process has produced iPhones and all of these kinds of things, and I think that, that will continue. Um, I, I, I don't think we should be above a cultural critique of what, what, what those kinds sure. of things do to people or, or sure. uh, things, but I do think that, yeah, I don't think, I think that, that, that it's unnatural or plain God um, evolution isn't a good does argument. not select for making people happy. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It doesn't select for making animals happy. So we, yeah. we, we should ro robustly expect an increase in future capacity and increase in, in abilities. 
that doesn't necessarily mean an increase in satisfaction. Or no, or we, like we seem to be no happier than people in the, the 17th well, century or the Middle Ages or any time. So yeah, I'm not, I, I'm right. not sure. Yeah, a question for both, but it comes from something I recall Robin saying, something about if the M or if the being in that world isn't doing what that world wants, it's not going to survive. But what is that want? Who determines that? Talk a little bit, maybe question to both. What determines want? What is want? And where does it come from? Who determines So that's where this biological analogy is, is useful. When you ask, what do most animals want? <laughs> what do they do? Uh, you know, the the... the Rabbit has to do what it takes to survive, whether it wants to or not. In some sense, evolution changes its wants to induce it to do the things that evolution needs it to do. Uh, for, with humans, we have many ways to change what we want. It's probably too slow to change genetically, but we have a whole lot of cultural ways to change what people want. And so there'll be cultural selection for getting people to want to do the things they need to do. So think of a thousand years ago subsistence farming. Farming isn't a natural thing for humans. Humans evolved as foragers, right? So what are farmers doing all this farming for a hundred years ago? And But they were really right on the edge. They had to do farming pretty efficiently or they didn't get enough food to survive, right? So they, but they did it for a thousand different reasons. In their head, they had all sorts of different reasons for each thing they did. But nevertheless, the net effect is if they don't they aren't acting efficiently enough in their farming behavior or their war, war behavior or things like, or their raising children behavior, then they get selected out. So evolution has been just selecting the way it's been for all animals for us. Yeah, I think that's right. I, um, a, a lot of the things that we see in humans are in response to, to, to things. I was just, just reading about the, 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 the human necessity of gossip. So um, group selection theory suggests that being in a group, acting as a group is really hard because cheaters always have the advantage. If you can be in the group but not pay group costs, you're, you're, you're ahead of the game. And so humans have evolved these strong policing mechanisms to keep, to keep the group cohesive. And, 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 they, they, and they play out pretty much in terms of guilt and shame. You know, I feel guilty when I'm not contributing to the group. I feel the group will then shame me if I'm not contributing to the group. And, and gossip is one of the ways that, 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 that group behavior is policed in ways like that. And, you know, we want to live in a world without gossip or, you know, that, that, would, be, that would be better. But evolution needed that to form human groups in the first place. So it's a really interesting... I actually make a stronger claim not, not that I know he disagrees with it, but just a lot of futurists or transhumanists think that most of our human mental capacities are inefficient and irrelevant, and as soon as some reasonable computer competes with us, we're out of there because we're just so stupid and inefficient. But in fact, most of these mental capacities are relatively robust capacities for dealing with complicated social worlds. And mm -hmm. these future worlds of M's or whatever are complicated social worlds. So whatever replaces us will have to solve all of these problems too, nearly at mm -hmm. least as well. Mm -hmm. It has to solve the problem of looking for cheaters, sharing information, figuring out how to present yourself well to others, all of these things that all we're doing. So love and status and, all, you know, and envy and all these things we have that seem like that people think about well, that's just some random human feature that, that, that's useless and inefficient computer will get rid of it. These things are here for a reason and relatively robust reasons for many of them. Are there evolutionary consequences of that among the M's? So for example, would that lead them to be different communally than we are in some substantial ways? Uh, yes, a bit. Yeah. I discussed that in my book, actually. So, so there are some ways in which it looks like modern social worlds are different from ancient social worlds, such that some of our behavior isn't very optimal. So uh, we, we are probably a little too trusting of each other in larger worlds. And most people don't play enough office politics for their personal benefits. So I predict, in fact, uh, Ems will learn to play office politics better than you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys not. Uh, and me too. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so I have, a, I have a question respectively for Steve and Robin. Um, but may, I want to kind of precede that with one for Robin so that you guys have a little time to maybe think about your answer. So the question for you respectively is, what would it take for you to identify as a transhumanist? What would it take for you to identify as Mormon? The preceding question, the preceding question is, um, let's, uh, knowing, knowing in advance, um, based on your work, 
what an M society looks like with subsistence wages and so forth, what would be the benefit of choosing to participate in the world? Uh, you don't die. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I, just, I have a very fundamental urge to want to be part of the future, to be part of whatever happens, to influence and to join it and to you know, not give up on it. So uh, to the, that's one of the exciting things about being a futurist looking ahead. You say, wow, the future can be big and more capable and have all these things and you'd like to be part of it. And so whatever downsides it has, it's, it's our heritage. If, if it happens, it's our heritage. It's the thing that goes on and be, fills the universe with things somewhat like us. And if you want to influence that process and be part of that process, then just like, just like if you were a subsistence farmer a thousand years ago and people told you industry was coming, you say, industry, that looks ugly. I don't like industry. And I think, well, you don't join up with industry. You're kind of on the outside here. You're just not part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what would it take me to be a, a, a transhumanist? I, I, I probably just need the discussions. I'm already kind of... Curriculum. <laughs> 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 We're working on it. <laughs> Yeah, use the commitment thing, you know. <laughs> if you find out, would you be willing to become a transhumanist and go to work? That might be the hardest part for me, is <laughs> my time constraints at the university are so small or so intense that I'd, 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 be, I'd be a really, you'd see me as a cheater and you'd want to shame me. For <laughs> the idea of transhumanism, would you have any apprehensions fundamentally to the idea of transhumanism? Because accepting a label is one thing. I know a lot about labels. But um, the concept, transhumanism. Um, oh, sorry. I, 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 don't, I don't see a problem offhand. I mean, I don't really, I don't, I don't, I don't self-identify as a transhumanist. And, and I think in part because I think what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that there's good things, but I'm worried that there could be things that I wouldn't want to be. I mean, not that the transhumanists bring it about, but, but sure. society itself, I mean, I, already I really hate people walking around with headphones out in nature. It just bugs me. <laughs> it really does. And I think, that, that, that's wrong. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. And, 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 and so I, I kind of think that there are probably things coming that with my old brain, my old brain that probably would never be selected to be an M just because it's not very adaptable to those kinds of things. Um, I may resist. Uh, um, my, my kid uh, have got me gaming though for the first time this week. I, they introduced me to Journey and I'm completely captivated and I'm starting to say, yeah, this isn't that bad. This is... <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so. I want to specialize in the world in being an analyst. That is, that is, I want to say, I know you guys all want to talk about values and argue about morality and things like that, but you, you need people like me to just figure out the facts as the <laughs> basis true. for what you're doing. And I want to specialize in that role. And in that role, I want to focus on saying things with words that have clear meanings. And so I get shy about em embracing words and statements whose words I don't really understand because they have so many different connotations. And so, you know, I just want to put a different hat on or something when I say those sorts of things because I don't want to confuse that because otherwise you see that next to my analysis, his analysis is fuzzy. Look at this thing he says, how sloppy that is, right? You know? yeah. So for me, even the word transhumanism, but also the word Mormon, I go, well, what does that mean to people exactly? <laughs> you know, if, if it had a clear, if it was clearly just some sort of vague association with, you know, a cultural heritage or something, I'd say, fine. You know, I, I'm happy with embracing the cultural heritage of Mormonism. They look like great people. They produce great societies. They, they get, I'm happy to get along with them, things like that. You know, I like their families, etc. There, there's lots of things I like about the culture, which is great if, if I could just embrace it culturally. But by Mormon, you mean, oh, you, you believe these scriptures and you, you, you are devoted to obeying this church. And you go, oh, I, you know, I'd, I'm Mormon and I don't conform to all well, that. <laughs> So, but I mean, that, that's also for transhumanism. Transhuman also has some associations. I go, well, some of the associations are like, and some it's less clear. And I'd, I'd rather just say words that I can say clearly what they mean and just. Not comfortable with ambiguity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure. Okay, I'm going to have to cut off the question. I know, right? Good idea. We're going to have to cut off questions for now because dinner's ready in the other room. But everyone, please give a big round of applause to our keynote speakers. 
Thank you. And uh, give a round of applause to the people that organized this. This has been amazing. I'm I know, so, I feel so honored to have been invited here. This has been amazing.